enough I to listen to us. Let Grand me ask you the other Grand thing, Bill, yeah. Eddie, because um, it, it is intriguing. You know, we think of Little and Large, we think of Morecambe and Wise, we think of the two Ronnies. Well, it takes a particular type of of skill and and comradeship to make that work. I mean, there are ups and downs. You've had a few tiffs in your time as well. But does that take a particular type of human being to make a double act work? Oh, definitely. I think with the, with the two Ronnies not being sort of live performers like me and Sid and Eric and Ernie, you know, doing the treadmill of summer season and pantomimes, they only really came together for the television programmes. That helps. And subsequently, they went on to do live performances. But um, I think that does help, because they were two individual comedy actors, weren't they? Indeed so. You don't so. have to sort of live in each other's pocket like early double acts did. Yeah. Eddie, great to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed for finding time for us this morning. OK. Eddie Large there. And talking of large, uh, an absolute pun intended, one of the really big figures of the comedy circuit, Bernard Manning, has joined us on the line now. Bernard, a very good morning to you. Morning. Morning. Um, I was, sad news, uh, sad news. It is sad news, but, but I'm going to cheat slightly, because I did hear you a little bit earlier on somewhere else, and, and my bosses, I hope, will forgive me for saying it, but you talked particularly powerfully about the workload that, that this a, man that took it. on no, over just, the years. He's just been on to a fellow there that uh, did his, one of his first bookings with me in the 60s. Uh, uh, Eddie Large there. Yeah. Wonderful fellow. And uh, I gave him, he'll tell you, I gave him £60 for the week. And they did uh, 14 shows for that. So these people start right at the bottom. Yeah. And uh, they work very, and that was, that's what kills them. Because it kills us all in the end. Uh, it, it's such a hard workload we have. You know, and especially double acts. The heat in the studios is like a, an afternoon in Bombay. You know, and, and the heat, and, and you're learning your lines, you're learning, uh, you get, you've got to get your timing right, and the shows he did, Porridge, Open All Hours, The Two Ronnies, you know, and he had a, an antiques firm, he was into antiques, was Ronnie, and uh, it's a big load. No wonder they die of our failure, I'll tell you. Yeah. It's nice, like, I'd, I've made show business really cushy, because I never stop overnight anywhere. I never stop in hotels. I go to the club or the theatre or whatever it is, quick it, do my stuff, leave them laughing, wanting more, and up the motorway. Many a time the compere said, it's no nice, you clapping, he's halfway up the M6 right now. <laughs> <laughs> Which so, do you rate him most highly for, though, um, uh, Bernard? It, as a oh, writer, his versatility. as a performer, as an actor? His versatility. He could yeah. do anything. He put his mind to it. He could do anything. Some all day. I mean, that porridge in the in the prison cell and all that carry on. Some of the the lines. They were good lines. I don't suppose he wrote them, but it, it, even if you don't write them, you've got to say them, and your, your timing's got to be right. And uh, open all hours with the tail going in and out. And, uh, well, well, you've got to laugh when you think about him, haven't you? You've got to laugh. I don't, sure like you, I, to be honest with you, I, I, I don't know whether he wrote uh, or how much of the, the, the sitcom stuff he wrote, but, of course, he's celebrated for having written about 75% of the two Ronnies material. Oh, well, there but, you and, are. More, and, and, more under, hard work. More and, hard. But under a pseudonym. He didn't submit it as Ronnie Barker. No, the, no. the producer would obviously say, well, we'd better let the star get on. He, he used this pseudonym of, uh, of George Wiley, or Gerald Wiley. Yeah, yeah, well, more hard work. Well, I'm sure Ronnie Corbett, the man who has that, the modesty of the man. Yeah, I'm sure Ronnie Corbett's devastated. I'll have to give him a ring and see how he's getting on. But I'm sure they came to see me at the London Palladium. When the comedians at the London Palladium, they came backstage and said hello and congratulated us on a good show. And it was my was that? That was 1972. And that was the golden era of comedy: the Groucho Marxes and the George Burns. And the Sid and Eddie Large, Morecambe and Wise, uh, Cannon and Ball. It was real good comedy on a Saturday night. Saturday nights are not the same now. Ant and Deck are not in the same street. Bernard Manning, good to talk to you. Thanks for joining My us pleasure. this morning. Thanks for ringing me.
There we are, Bernard Manning with his tributes to uh, a bygone age, symbolised in so many ways by the gentleman whose image is behind me now, who died at the age of 76, late yesterday. Now, uh, as you can see at the bottom of the screen there, um, we would like you to uh, send in your uh, tributes to Ronnie as well, because he was one of those characters who I suspect we all felt we knew and came into our living rooms and uh, came onto our television sets. Um, uh, and we're very interested in hearing this morning what you think. You can email your views to us. There it is at newschannel at itv.com. Um, just let us know what you thought of him, what made him one of the true greats. And uh, also, I think we want to... Oh, yes, there is. Text it uh, as well on your, on your cell phone, if you want to do it that way. Just pop in the word news, followed by whatever your message is, to uh, 63338. 63338. And uh, what's your favourite sketch as well? That is something else that we would like to know. And if you'd like to do me a quiet favour, just between you and me, and don't tell anybody else, um, vote for the three of them when they're standing there saying, I know my place, because then they'll have to run that upstairs. But if you think it's a different one, then that's fine. But if you want to make a friend with me this morning, go for the three of them with John Cleese and the two Ronnies. Uh, there we are. Tributes, uh, emails, by text, however you want to do it the late, great Ronnie Barker. Now, we can take a quick break, but do stay with us, because coming up next on the ITV News Channel, we'll have more tributes uh, to one of Britain's best-loved comedians, Ronnie Barker, I hope including your own personal tributes. Ronnie has died at the age of 76. We're back in three minutes. Welcome back. This is the ITV News Channel. And the headlines so far this morning, the comedian Ronnie Barker has died. He was 76 and best known for being half of the double act, not with that gentleman, but of course with Ronnie Corbett in The Two Ronnies. Now, just before the break, I was talking about that uh, celebrated sketch where uh, John Cleese, very tall, said, I'm an upper-class gentleman and what have you, and uh, Ronnie Barker in the middle said, I'm middle-class, I look up to him, I look down on him, and poor little Ronnie Corbett said, I know my place. Uh, well, we've had a tribute now from John Cleese, uh, who began his comedy career with Barker in the 60s, uh, and said, I was very sad to hear of the death of Ronnie Barker, who was such a warm, friendly and encouraging presence to have when I started off in television. He was also a great comic actor to learn from. Great tribute there from uh, John Cleese. And also Michael Palin, another uh, celebrated member of the Monty Python team, but also now known as uh, one of the real geniuses of travel journalism on television. Uh, Michael says, I can't think of anyone who knew how to play comedy better than Ronnie Barker, and I count myself enormously fortunate to have known and worked with him. Michael goes on to say, Ronnie was a straightforward, down-to-earth man who had this extraordinary ability to make the nation laugh, probably more often than anyone else I know. Michael Palin and John Cleese. What extraordinary tributes. And I'm delighted another old mate of mine now has joined us on the line, Christopher Biggins, uh, who played a character called Lukewarm Lewis in Porridge. Biggins, it's good to have you on the line, but what a sad circumstance in which we talk. It really is sad. I mean, he was, uh, he was just the most brilliant, brilliant, not comedian. That is what I think is always so clever. He was a comic actor. A lot of people thought he was a comedian, but he wasn't. And he... Uh, talk about uh, earlier, I think it was John saying, one really did learn from him. It's 1974 we started Porridge, and I can't tell you, I couldn't have had a better teacher. It, 30 years on, Porridge is still being shown, I'm pleased to say, and is still as fresh and as wonderful. That's due to him and, of course, Dick Clements and Ian Lafrenet, who wrote it. Uh, I was, funnily enough, I was going to ask you that because it cropped up in another conversation and, and, and I didn't know, but it, he didn't write that. No, uh, he didn't. That, that, absolutely. But, but the, the other point, which you will know a great deal about as well, as far as the two Ronnies were concerned, uh, he wrote a great deal of that, but again, almost in secret, because he used this, uh, this fake name of, was it Gerard, Gerald <laughs> Willie or yes, George Willie or something like that? It was always a very that. funny thing, but he did, no, he did write uh, all those... Uh, Wonderful sketches. I mean, the, the one that uh, is the fork sketch. Do you know the one about the forks? Yes, I do. Yes. I mean, that was fork, one of the cleverest fork things. Fork candles. That's right, <laughs> fork candles. I mean, it was just wonderful. I mean, you know, and he was, he, you know, he, he was a very, very clever writer. Um, he was an inspiration, and, and the, the, the loss of this comic genius will be huge. 
and a very nice human being. Oh, an unbelievably nice human being. You know, when we were in rehearsals, it was always such fun. And even though we had this fantastic Dick Clements, Ian Lafrenet uh, script, which was very rarely changed, but if it was changed, Ronnie was so... He never thought of him. He thought of the whole piece. And if he thought it was better for someone else to have one of his lines, he would give it to them. That's wonderful. And he was right. He got, the, you know, it got a better laugh because he was looking at the bigger picture. There we are. Christopher, thank you for joining us this thank morning. Thank you. Good to talk to you. After the break, Bruce Forsyth with his memories of Ronnie Barker. Stay with us. Hello and welcome to Live with Alastair Stewart. It's 11 o'clock on Tuesday the 4th of October. The passing of a king of comedy. One of Britain's best-loved comedians, Ronnie Barker, has died at the age of 76. His best-known performances were perhaps as Ronnie Corbett's partner in The Two Ronnies, also as Fletch in Porridge. He was not just a brilliant performer, but a fantastically funny writer too. We'll have reaction from Bruce Forsyth in just a few seconds. But our top story this morning is the sad death of Ronnie Barker. It's thought that the 76-year-old suffered heart failure yesterday in a hospice near his Oxfordshire home. He became a household name as one half of the legendary duo The Two Ronnies. Let me just read to you two extraordinary quotes. First of all, from John Cleese. I was very sad to hear of the death of Ronnie Barker, who was such a warm, friendly and encouraging presence to have when I started off in television. He was a great comic actor and from Sir Peter Hall, the theatre director. He was not only a great comedian, but a great actor. Bruce Forsyth is a man who straddles most aspects of show business and excels in all of them. Bruce, you must be very sad this morning. Very sad indeed, and I'm even sadder to, um, to have to tell you I never worked with Ronnie. I never worked with Ronnie Barker at all. It's, it's a shame that when you have a career so long that you never get a chance to work with somebody who was such a master of his trade. Ronnie Corbett I worked with many, many times, but never Ronnie Barker. Um, I, I didn't really know him very much socially either. The, the, my last wonderful memory of him was when, after David Frost's garden party that he has every year, that was last year, um, a group of us, Michael Parkinson, and his wife, Jimmy Tarbuck and his wife, Ronnie Corbett and his wife, Ronnie Barker and his wife, and myself and my wife, all sitting at a, a dinner table for two and a half hours. We didn't stop laughing and joking, all the memories we had of different things we'd done in the business. And that's the memory I'll keep, because he had a wonderful evening with us, although you could see he was, he was getting to be a little bit frail mm. even then. Uh, that is a lovely memory, uh, but also let me cast you then in an intriguing role, given that, that you didn't actually work cheek by jowl with him, but, but I know you watch all of the competition and you watch very closely everything else that's on television, so just turn yourself into uh, the role of TV critic, having watched his work, having seen him perform, how good was he? Well, I, I probably wouldn't make a very good TV critic with Ronnie because I'd have to uh, just say wonderful things about him all the time. And TV critics can't do that. We don't even close. It would be jolly good if they could, Bruce. It would be jolly good if they could. Um, exactly. it, but he, he was, he was uh, so good at everything he did. He was meticulous. And, and what I heard that your last caller um, uh, talking about uh, him being such a great actor. I mean, he was a comedy actor. Uh, you just can't call Ronnie Barker a comedian, uh, an actor and a great writer, which made him so very, very special. And this is why you can't replace people like Ronnie Barker. They're irreplaceable. We're just, Bruce, as you were talking there, we, we, we're looking now at the, the, the famous... I you had somebody else there. No, not at all. No, no, I just... We're listening to you, but, but the, the, the pictures that people at home were, were looking at as you were talking included that the famous John Cleese, Ronnie Barker, Ronnie Corbett sketch, as well as uh, a, a bit of porridge and a bit of open oh, all I see. hours. I see. Um, it, it, what, I, I only underline that because you make the point yourself that, that he really was a master of so many different aspects of his trade. Now, 
Bernard Manning was on the line a wee while ago and he said, that was of another era. We don't see that now. That was of another time. Do you sense that as well, Bruce? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, I think so because um, uh, you just have to look at television these days uh, to realise you're not getting shows like Porridge and... Um, uh, and and uh, open all hours, and they're not being repeated. Uh, the the BBC has done this new one, the Green Green Grass, mm. uh, which because it's written by John Sullivan, has has been sort of like a, a sequel to Only Fools and Horses, and that works because it's done in that very special John Sullivan way. And uh, this is what I believe we need more on television, more middle of the road middle-of-the-road situation comedies that people, that the uh, whole family audience can laugh at, whether they're young and old. It is interesting, isn't it? Although, I mean, Bernard Manning's got a bit of edge to him and has, has, has ruffled a few feathers over the years. He's ruffled but mine a few times. I, 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 <laughs> I, I was wondering whether you were going to say that or not. But, but intri <laughs> intriguing to reflect upon, uh, uh, reflect upon Ronnie. Um, never traded in smut. Never traded in bad no, language. No, there was sometimes there was especially in the songs they did, the two Ronnies. There would often be a line that was a little bit suggestive, but it was never uh, as today. You can get really vulgar lines and crude lines coming over, very blatant. There was always that double, that double entendre to it. You know, in the same way that Max Miller used to have. It was yeah. your mind that it was, there was always a double meaning. And with Ronnie, it was the same. But he was never, um, he was never ever crude at any time in his career. Bruce Forsyth, a pleasure to talk to you, and thank you so much for finding time for us on the News Channel this morning. No, I'd always find time for a man like Ronnie Parker. Thank you, Bruce. Bye bye. Goodness me, uh, powerful um, praise from big names: Peter Hall, John Cleese, Bruce Forsyth. They don't get much bigger than those three uh, telling us their thoughts now. A pause, a breath, and we move on to the other big story that's dominating uh, our news coverage uh, this morning, and it is indeed the Conservative Party conference up in uh, Blackpool.